Hey there, so I want to jump right in today. We are in week six of our series with, and in this portion of the series, we're talking about prayer. And we're looking at Matthew chapter six, verse nine through 13, commonly referred to as the Lord's Prayer, or you may have heard it referred to as the Our Father. And this is what Jesus was teaching his followers in response to their question, which was, teach us how to pray. There's many things they could have asked him to teach them, but they said, teach us how to pray. They knew that that's where the source of all these other things came from. And so then Jesus says, he says, this then is how you should pray. So, I mean, ears perk up, right? Paying attention. He's about to tell us, this is how you should pray. And he didn't mean that we just repeat this prayer all the time, but these are the areas of prayer that you need to come to the Father with. And so last week, we looked at a a few of them. I'm going to review that in just a second. Right now, let's read this prayer in its entirety, okay? Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. No matter where you're watching, read it out loud with me. Let your ears hear your mouth say it. Here we go. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I just went back into that King James stuff. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So last week we looked at uh, verse 9 and verse 10. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we talked about, we approach him as our father, Abba, dad. He's, he's that intimate. That's what he desires. Jesus was saying, that's how the father wants you to see him, our father. You're approaching a good, benevolent, good father. And he wants to re-image that for a lot of people. Hallowed be your name. Set apart is your name. You're good. You're our father, but you're also holy. You alone are holy. You alone are sovereign and almighty. Our Father, hallowed be your name. And then we began to pray, your kingdom come. We learn that kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. We begin to pray that over our lives, lives of our family, our friends, co-workers. Your kingdom come. Your will be done, which was an issue of trust and surrender. God, I want your will done on my life. Do you believe that God has a perfect will for your life? If so, I want to pray that. God, I want to surrender to your will in my life. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that's how we approach him. Now, today we're going to look at two different types of prayer in this one section here, verse 11 and 12. So the first is this, Matthew 6, 11 says, Give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. These prayers are about bringing our needs, our desires, our requests to God. Give us, it says, this day. This day reminds us of our our daily reliance upon God and our need for connection with him on a daily basis. He doesn't just give us what we're going to need. Give us this day. It's very specific. Our daily bread. C.S. Lewis said this. I love it. Relying on God has to begin all over again every day as if nothing had yet been done. We want a daily reliance on God. I don't know about you, but I need that so much. A daily need of connection with him. So why is this prayer important? The prayers of request. Here it is. Number one is asking, requesting, asking nurtures relationship. Something relational goes on in just the asking. Something, there's a connection there. And God is always interested in relationship. It is paramount to him. It transcends everything else. That's what he's after, his relationship. And asking nurtures relationship. There's a story, you can read it later. I hope you do. It's in Mark chapter 10. And Jesus and his disciples are coming into Jericho. And and by this time, his fame had spread. So crowds gather everywhere where they hear he's coming into that town. And there was... A beggar on the side of the road. There was many people, probably many beggars. There's this one in particular that the story speaks of. His name is Bartimaeus, and he was blind. And it says, when he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was coming into Jericho where he was, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He began to shout that out. I guarantee you his wasn't the only voice, but he began to shout it out, have mercy on me. 
People are trying to tell him to, to shut up, to be quiet, leave him alone. Jesus heard him. He always hears that. Even crowds, there's, he hears that sincerity. He hears that plea. And he heard him and he said, bring him to me. And so they brought this blind beggar, Bartimaeus, to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, I love this, he said, what is it that you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do? What is it that you want? And Bartimaeus responded, and he asked Jesus, would you heal me? Would you heal me? I love that Jesus brought it to a conversation and didn't just, you know, speak a word and send out healing over there, but brought it to a conversation. In fact, the first thing that, that Bartimaeus is crying out is, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What is he saying by that? He's saying, see me, have pity on me. Do I matter? And Jesus responded to that, yes, you do matter. Bring him to me. Then he saw that he was a beggar. He didn't have to ask him, what is it you want? Maybe he just would have you know, put a coin in the jar. But he said, what do you want? Soliciting conversation, asking. And then he responded to that. Bartimaeus, this man, mattered to Jesus. And Jesus was nurturing conversation and relationship in that. And that's the same lesson he gives to us. Is you matter. He wants you and me to ask him for our daily bread, those things that we need. It fosters relationship. Bring this conversation to me. Talk to me about that. Give us today. Daily implies we'll talk again tomorrow. Give us this day, our daily bread. It implies relationship that continues. I remember one of the first times I felt that God really spoke to me about this truth. I was a youth pastor at a church in Sacramento and uh, times were tight financially, really tight. And then we just had our second son. And so now what was tight seemed strangling. And I was panicking. And I, I thought I should maybe do this or leave and go do this and do this. And I was praying. And I was stressed. I was full of anxiety over it because I, I was working hard. I didn't know how to just get more money. And now we had a new mouth to feed and a child I wanted to take care of. And it was just a season but I remember going to him in prayer one, one morning and I was praying and I'm like almost, you know, just releasing all the anxiety on God about, you know, do you care? Do you see me? Are you going to take care of me? I think I'm doing your will. What's going on? I'm releasing, releasing in him like a good Abba, like a good father. He's listening. And then he speaks to me. I mean, he just speaks to me. It silences my anxiety and he speaks to my heart. And, and what he was asking me was, do you have food, you and your family today? And I was like, yeah. Do you have shelter? Are your needs met today? And they were met. So I was like, yes, God, they are. And then it was like he said, I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow. And it was a neat moment for me because I got up at that instance and, uh, you know, you don't hear, I didn't hear his voice audible, but I knew he was speaking to me that, like, son, I'll take care of you. I promised you to give you your daily sustenance, what you need daily. And it implies, let's come back. Let's keep this relationship going. Give us today. Okay. The strongest relationships are those who have constant communication. Those are the strongest one, and that's what that daily implies. Here's another reason it's so important is asking acknowledges dependence. So by and large, we live quite unaware of our dependence on God. For most of us in the West, our affluence has kept us from recognizing our dependence. But God has always been in the habit of teaching people that I want to be that source that you are dependent upon, right? So daily bread, give us this day our daily bread, asking him, it reinforces that, it acknowledges that our dependence comes upon him. He's always done this with his people. In the Old Testament, a part of the Bible that was before Jesus came, he was uh, leading Israel, the nation of Israel, out of the, the bondage, the slavery of Egypt. It was their exodus out of Egypt into a promised land, right? A land that they said was flowing with milk and honey, a land of abundance. And in this journey, there was a season where God provided for them manna. It was manna from heaven that would come and drop on the ground and they were to pick up as much as they needed for the day. They weren't allowed to pick up some and store it for other days out of fear or worry. 
but only for the day. If they picked up more than they needed, it would spoil by the morning. And he was teaching them, I want you to know that I am your source. And why was this so important? It was so important because they were going to a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of prosperity, a land of abundance. And when they got into a land of abundance, he didn't want them to forget, look, I'm your source. And we tend to forget our dependence upon him when we're living in the abundance. It's a lesson he's always wanting us to know because he's the only thing that's stable, completely stable. He's not tethered to a stock market or an economy or anything. He's God. He says, I want to. So coming to me, give, us, give me this day our daily bread, or give us this day our daily bread, reinforces and acknowledges our dependence upon him. And our daily bread doesn't necessarily mean the carbs in a loaf reliance on food. Most of us are not actually worried about where we're going to get our meal the next day. There are plenty of people in the world who are, but for many of us, that's not the concern. We know other daily dependences upon God. You and I do. Strength. God, I need your strength today to make it through another day. God, I need your courage to face this health issue that I'm facing or a loved one is facing. Lord, I need your joy today. I'm going to need it tomorrow, but Lord, you promise to sustain me for today. God, I need your direction today in this uncertain time. Lord, would you speak to me? Give us this day our daily bread. That's what God, it it acknowledges my reliance upon him, and it acknowledges my dependence upon him. Jesus even knew this. Jesus modeled this. And there's another area of dependence that Jesus modeled that I think we can learn from too. John chapter 4 Read that another time as well. John chapter 4, he has this encounter with this woman, a Samaritan woman, at a well. The disciples had went off into town to procure some food and bring it back. And while they were gone, he had this incredible conversation and interaction with the Samaritan woman. And it was life-changing for her. After the conversation, she had left to go tell the people in the village of what had just transpired and could this be the Messiah. While she was gone, the disciples came back and that he wasn't hungry, right? And they had gotten food and they're thinking maybe somebody else fed him. And he says this to them. He says, look, John chapter four, verse 34, my food, Jesus says, my food, give us this day our daily bread. My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Give us today our daily bread. I, I think about this, Lord, like, acknowledges my need of his direction to be in his service, to do his work. My daily bread is my daily opportunity to merge with his mission, to merge with the service that he wants me to be a part of. Lord, give us this day, me, my daily bread. What's my, what's my assignment? How can I be a part of the Father's work? Ephesians 6 talks about this when it says, and your feet are fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, that I'm ready, what do you bring in my way? Give me this day, Lord, the clarity, the courage to meet the opportunities that you are bringing me my way today. Give me this day my daily bread. In fact, it's a great time to plug the prayer walk app again. If you haven't downloaded that, do that. Prayer walk app. And you can track where you're going. My wife and I, we do this in the neighborhoods. And it's got prayer prompts. And and you can be praying, Lord, how do I pray for my neighbors today? Lord, how do I pray? You might run across somebody in your walk. It's a great opportunity. If you haven't done it, download that prayer app, okay? So that's recognizing our reliance and our dependence upon him. And we want to do that in the small things. Because it builds our faith. Not just wait for the big crisis. But in the small things, daily, in the ordinary. So that when the big thing comes... Our faith is ready because it's been, it's been built and proven that we can trust him in the ordinary. I want to say just a little bit before we move on to the next point on what about when it seems that God doesn't answer. And it's painful. And it's confusing. Listen, I want you to know this. God's silence is not the same as God's absence. Even when it seems like he is silent, the scriptures promised He will never, hear that word, never leave you. He will never forsake you. Sometimes the question that we have is why? And and I say this with all tenderness, truly. Uh, Maybe we could say another question too, and that's where. Not why, but where. Where are you in this, Lord? Where are you? What? What is it that you're doing in me? I know you haven't left me. I know you haven't forsaken me. I don't understand this. 
I'm hurting, I'm in pain. But God, what are you doing in me? Where are you? Help me to see you. Lead me to a rock that is higher than I. I need your perspective. I understand those times personally. So we pray for our needs, realizing that what matters most to God is the relationship he has that he desires to have with us. One of the things that can get in trouble with that relationship that we want to make sure that doesn't get uh, encumbered with God and, and, and we have distance with him is our greatest need and his greatest gift to us, and that's forgiveness. So this is the second type of prayer, and it's in the second part of this verse that we're looking at today, verse 12. He says, pray this way, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So why is this prayer important? Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Number one, it brings freedom through forgiveness. Unconfessed debt, unconfessed sin, causes me to distance myself, whether it's from others or from God. And confession is the road that we travel that leads us back to what we really need, and that is forgiveness. Confession is that road that bridges us and gets us back to God, what we really need, to be forgiven. So here's a popular verse, one of my favorites, because I've needed to claim it so many times in my life. 1 John 8 and 9, 1 John 1, 8 and 9 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. However, if we confess our sins, notice that, if, if we not just hold on to them and bury them, act like they didn't happen, go into shame, no. If we confess, if we declare it, if we confess our sins, he, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Take that unrighteousness and get rid of it. How? Through confession. Through confession. Through calling it what it is. This was sin. This, is, this was an error. This was wrong. I was wrong. To bring that to God and to confess it. I love how Frederick Buckner explained this. He said, to confess your sins to God is not to tell God anything God doesn't already know. Until you confess them, however, they, your sins, are the abyss between you. When you confess them, they become the bridge. Forgiveness brings us peace with God. We experience freedom when we confess. We experience freedom. Freedom from what, Mark? Freedom from that shame. Freedom from the darkness, the, the, the condemnation, the fear of punishment. That, that aching in us, you know what I'm talking about, where there's unconfessed sin and we, we feel that inside. We want freedom from that. God has provided it to us. How? Through confessing to him our sin. Here's an example of this in scripture. And I've lived this out. David here is talking and he says, Psalm 32, when I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away. I was groaned all day long. Day and night your hand of discipline was heavy upon me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, thank God for the day finally comes. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. You ever been there? I have. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. <laughs> Man, I think God is so jealous as a father. He doesn't want his children to live in the, the tyranny of darkness and the shame and the junk in our hearts when we're, we're dealing with and we're suppressing this and we, got it, we try to bury it, we try to cover it up with good works, everything else. His hand is heavy upon us saying, no, there's another way. There's only one way to freedom, to be emancipated from that junk inside and that is to confess our sins. And he takes them and he casts them as far as the east is from the west. And he says he removes us and we become clothed in the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's what he wants for you and I. So, hear me. If you're going to have a close relationship with God, there's a couple of things that you're going to need. Number one is a habit of confession. That's for sure. You're just going to have to have a habit. That's just going to be something that's a part of your life. And you're going to need to have a deep dependence on his mercy. You don't need it just once in a while, every day. That's why it says his mercy is new every morning. And it's a, it's a humble walk. 
because we are in need of his mercy and we're ready to confess so we can keep moving forward. All right, here's the second thing and the final thing about uh, confession. It brings healing through forgiveness. Now remember it says in the, in the prayer that we're looking at, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So we're not only praying for God to forgive us our debts, but also as we have forgiven our debtors. If you are a Jesus follower, it is a given. It is a part of being a Jesus follower that we forgive others. It's what we do. <laughs> and the simple yet profound reason we forgive others is because he has first forgiven us. He has forgiven us. He has not held our sin against us. He remembers it no more. And he has forgiven us. And then he says, likewise, you go and do the same. To forgive other people. I have been set free. God has set me free. I have freedom from the guilt and the shame, the fear and punishment, all these things. I have a right connection with him this way. That's the my sin part. I bring that to God. I've confessed my sin. He says, you're free from that. I forgive you. Now, what about not the sin that I do, but what about the sin that is done against me? What about that? What about that sin that is done against me? Healing. See, freedom comes as you confess it this way and you're freed. Healing comes through forgiving others their debts against you. The relationship may never be mended, but you're forgiving them. You are releasing them. And it's not because they asked for an apology or admitted they're wrong. Forgiveness is not predicated upon their admission of guilt. Forgiveness is not really so much about them as it is about you being healed and releasing that thing. You receive healing as you forgive others. But what about, Mark, what they did? Listen, God is a just God. God is concerned about you. He wants, somebody once said it this way, if you have unforgiveness and that's in you, having that unforgiveness, it's like you drinking poison and waiting for them to die or them to be hurt. We want to get that out. Forgiveness of those who have sinned against me their trespasses against me, when I forgive them, when I release them, when I loose them, it's like loosing the toxins and the poisons out of my own heart. I release you. I'm not, I'm not saying, we may, we may not have a relationship even. There may have to be some very strong boundaries. Forgiveness on this part doesn't mean forgetfulness. There may be some boundaries, but I am releasing the debt that I have felt you've owed me. You are loosed from this, forgiving others their debts, their trespasses. It's releasing the junk out of your own heart. I like how Rick Warren said it. He said, when others cause pain in our lives, we often respond by trying to get even. Ironically, in our effort to get even with the person who has wronged us, we don't get even. We sink to the other person's level. God calls us to a much greater response, and that is forgiveness. When you're mistreated, the proper reaction isn't to blow up or to clam up. Both are irresponsible. Instead, God calls us to respond to insults with calmness, love, and truth. Here's the bottom line. Trust God to settle the score. He has much better resources to do that than you do. Trust God to settle it. I know that's easier said than done, but he's God. He's got you. He does, and it's important. Forgiveness is so paramount to the Christian's life because he says if you don't forgive others their trespasses your heavenly father will not forgive you yours we have been forgiven such a great debt so we want to lose others we're not saying it doesn't matter we're not saying it's fair or they deserve punishment you leave that up to God here's a scripture I want you to think about as we turn to close Matthew 18 18 Jesus is talking here and he says truly truly listen I tell you this whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven in context he's talking about here with somebody dealing with somebody who has sinned against you he's talking about that in context and he's saying if you bind it on earth like no no forgiveness you did this and it's bound then it's bound in heaven even between you and God and it's bound in heaven between what God wants to even do with them but when it's loosed how does it get loosed? Forgiveness. I forgive you. And you may have to 
remind yourself and tell yourself more than, more than uh, one or two times. I forgive, I loose. Then what's happened? Once I've loosed them, then I've lo- it's loosed in heaven. And now God can bring healing to me. He can right the wrongs. He can redeem. He can reclaim. He can restore. And I also believe, I believe it looses him to work in that person's life over there too. You leave them to God. He's bigger. He's got more powerful tools than you do to work with that person. Whatever is bound on earth, it's bound in heaven. Some of you need to hear that. And whatever is loosed on earth, it's loosed in heaven. Today is the day to loose that. To loose that and pray for God's grace to help you to be able to do that because he wants to bring more freedom into your life. Here's the bottom line. God wants an unbroken relationship with you. And he provided a a means by which nothing has to get in the way of that. We're going to fail. We're we're going to blow it. We're not going to live that perfect life. Nobody will. We're going to sin against other people, against God. We're going to have people sin against us. It's a part of this, this, this portion of life that we live in. It's a part of our daily experience. And that's why we want to posture ourselves that we are ready to forgive. That we're, we're re- when it happens, we're ready to loose. We don't want to carry that. We don't want it to build toxins in our heart. We want to release Loose so that God can loose. And if you're carrying around things in your own life that you have not brought to God to confess, look, he already knows about them. You're not telling him something he doesn't know. He knows about them. He loves you with them, but he loves you so much he wants you to be freed from them. So God wants us to walk in an unencumbered relationship with him that is not based on my performance, but the performance of Christ and what he did. And in that he wants you and I, to come to him and ask him about our daily needs, our requests, as we're praying. He cares about the ordinary, not just the big things. To pray about this and and remind ourselves of our reliance upon him and our dependence upon him. So I I don't know. I encouraged encouraged everybody last week in the message to, to begin, if you haven't already done that, to have Set aside 10 minutes, even in the morning, just to come into his presence with thanksgiving to our Father, my Father God, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come praying for yourself and your spouse, your kids, your family, your will be done in my life, government officials, Lord, in our country, your will be done. Give us this day our daily bread, these things that are important to you, these areas that you need, his joy, his strength, his provision. And pray that with him. Spend some time with him. It'll reorient your day, I guarantee you. Because I don't know. I've been walking with him for a while. And just in honesty, I don't know how you can have a, a close relationship with God without communication with him. Without the communication and the talking and the, and the confession and, and being with him and knowing his grace... It seems to be reduced down to just performance. I'm just trying to do better. And I get that. But he's invited you and I into something deeper, more meaningful. And that's a, that's a relationship. It's our Heavenly Father. And so I want to pray for you right now. And lead you in a prayer. And if it's a prayer that, that you are in agreement with, amen it. Say yes as I'm praying and and let it become your prayer. God, we thank you that you are a good, good father. That you love us, not in spite of our sin, but even with it. But you've provided a way for us not to be uh, steeped in our sin. Not to have our mistakes and our sins and our flaws and our failures, those things that define us. Our greatest gift is forgiveness, and you've provided that through us, through what Jesus did on the cross. Lord, forgive us our sins. And if you have any specifically that you know of, that you just need to say, God, forgive me how I treated that person, what I've done, what I did. Just tell him, Lord, forgive me for, and then insert it. Talk to him. And then, Lord, We ask for your grace to forgive others who have sinned against us. We want to forgive them their debts, whether that was 20 years ago, two days ago, or two minutes ago. 
Lord, I release. Just tell them, I release and then insert their name. I forgive them. I loose them, Lord. Please, God, work in their hearts, Lord. Work in my heart. I want to be free. I want to have the joy of the Lord. I want to walk in forgiveness so I loose others. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so glad. I'm, I'm trusting that you prayed with me. I want you to think about these things. Have that time with God. Um, get the prayer app. Walk your neighborhood. Pray for people. I, my encouragement, my hope through this part of the series is that prayer would be something that is just a regular part of our lives. We're conversating with God. We're having discussion with God. We're talking with God. We're going to go into a song right now called Yes, I Will. I'm going to come back after that and just give you an announcement or two. But enjoy this song. Think about the words of this song. It's a God who seriously loves you. We'll see you in a minute.